title and just yeah sorry i just need to accept it first of all um thank you for inviting me to present my research on identity and space technology in post-soviet space i'm I'm very delighted, and this is, and uh, also I have to know make a note that I this is very much work in progress. Some of this research has been already published, and uh, some of that uh, is still in writing, and I still even have some uh, field work lined up for the future. So yeah, there will be a bit of mixture of various um, aspects of my research, which are part of this bigger project. So in this uh, presentation, I'm going to use uh, the case of post-Soviet Kazakhstan uh, to discuss how elites and experts and, um, in semi-peripheral nations such as Kazakhstan uh, shape and debate uh, the, the national development of these countries uh, using uh, the space technology and uh, design, uh, kind of articulating the space, national space programs. I also am going to discuss uh, how what is the role played by the Soviet legacy uh, and infrastructural inheritance, which obviously in Kazakhstan is very significant because this is a country where Baikonur is located. And I also mentioned at the very end, I will discuss briefly the resistance and uh, to space programs developed by uh, the uh, Kazakhstani elites and, and why, uh, the, where this uh, resistance come from and what kind of tensions it provokes in the society on the ground. So as I, as I said, Kazakhstan inherited uh, much of the outer space and physical infrastructure created in the Soviet era, uh, especially space by uh, Port Baikonur, which is currently lent to the Russian Space Agency. In the last two decades at the same time, Kazakhstan developed quite significant its own ambitious space program, which involves both developing new space capabilities, but also gaining control gradually uh, over Baikonur in the future. The Russian invasion in Ukraine, however, created an entirely new social political reality, not only in these countries, Russia and uh, Ukraine, but also in the entire post-Soviet space, and in, in many countries uh, across the former Soviet Union, uh, political elites, uh, leadership, cultural elites, but also broader publics uh, now face questions about the independence, about the statehood, the national identity, and also sovereignty, how it needs to be reasserted, kind of reaffirmed, and, and, uh, and how to deal with new risks which obviously emerge in this uh, in this context. An existence and operation of the former Soviet but currently Russian uh, space infrastructure on the territory of Kazakhstan, um, as well as cooperation and quite intensive engagement with Russian space agency in in Kazakhstan in, in, uh, in developing Kazakhstan's own space program, all this obviously raises quite important questions how about the rules and principles of interaction. With, uh, between the former Soviet periphery, such as Kazakhstan, but not only, many other post-Soviet countries are in the same position, and the former center in Moscow. So looking at the evolution of space program development uh, allows us to trace first how many post-Soviet nations having uh, established their sovereignty, uh, what it implied for them in terms of breaking away from former dependencies and also building new type of relationship with the former Soviet space, Russia. But this is also the question about shaping the new image of an independent nation on the global arena, which is a nation which is aspires to be also seen as, a technology, as technologically advanced, uh, as capable of building, building new alliances on the international stage, but also um, able to mobilize its scientific and technological resources for kind of envisioning its global, new global identity. And also on the very on more symbolic level, we can talk here about the uh, instruments which uh, can be deployed to foster new national identity in uh, post-Soviet space. And obviously, as we know, the literature on nation building commonly focuses on language, on culture, on religion, historical narratives, whereas very important 
uh, means for promoting uh, a specific version of national identity. And the point, the point I want to make that techno scientific enterprise such as outer space technology uh, can also be deployed and has been deployed as a really important instrument for cultivation national identity in many newly independent nations. And Kazakhstan here provides a uh, really interesting case uh, uh, for that. And there are two main uh, th threads kind of which can be analyzed here. One of them uh, can be seen as uh, kind of reverberation or reiteration of a more global trend of post-colonial technopolitics, because um, as a matter of fact, from the 50s to 70s in the countries such as India, China, South Africa, or um, Israel, technopolitics very often oft offered an answer to multiple concerns and questions, uh, to anxieties about global status, about decolonization, about the prestige of scholars, uh, scientists, and engineers, but also uh, ho hoped to uh, help to make a strong case uh, for development and modern uh, scientific and technological infrastructure. But situating the questions about outer space in the context of social, in the context outside of major technological powers such as uh, US or uh, Soviet Union, now Russia. Um, obviously helps us to also to examine this broader spectrum of meanings and functions which actually can be fulfilled by space technologies. Well, techno science more generally, but space technology uh, more specifically. Because outer space here emerges as uh, the kind of venue, a specific venue where post-colonial nations can address the issue of new rising inequalities associated with access to outer space and also overcoming these divisions between nations which have outer space capabilities and which haven't. Uh, so, sorry, I think, do my slides change? Not really. No, we're on the first. Yeah, we can see the second. Yeah, time. okay. Okay, yeah, now I can change. I, I think there was something wrong with the button. I couldn't this I okay, so as I said, this space faring ambitions of uh, semi-peripheral, let's call them uh, this way, post-colonial nations really um, can be seen as a as a as a response to this new form of inequality which is driven by the desire to escape an independent under uh, the status of, of being underdeveloped uh, which is very often comes together with the status of post-colonial uh, but also as a way of an, an instrument of reinventing the national identity equipped with this future oriented uh, 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 future-oriented temporality, and as well to reassert their position on the global modernity map by building new alliances uh, across the globe with, uh, with um, various partners. So in a way, this cosmic technological advancement can be seen as, as a proxy for development because it serves both as an embodiment of the desire to become modern, but also as an information of this desired status once uh, this technology in one uh, form or another uh, been acquired or built by the country. And from this perspective, technopolitics of post-Soviet Kazakhstan uh, is not that different um, from what we could observe in many post-colonial nations across the globe, as I mentioned at the beginning. And in fact, Kazakhstan, with its aspiration to join the club of spacefaring nations, shares many of the same motives and incentives as other semi-peripheral countries, um, ha, uh, which, which other countries in semi-peripheries had to, for developing their space programs. But there is a second part of this argument, which relates more specifically to the post-Soviet conditions, and uh, which, which is also closely linked with the history of the Soviet space program and also existing space um, uh, infrastructure, which has been inherited, uh, as, as I said before, such as Baikonur. Uh, so existence of Russia 
and it's especially in its conduct on the international arena in recent um, months or even years, ref- certainly it does reflect on how post-Soviet nations built and rethink their connections and attitudes towards uh, the Soviet past, but also to, towards the other partners in the post-Soviet arena. So the question here, um, how Kazakhstan can, what, 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 has, what are the um, kind of possibilities to, to, to change uh, or to, to reconsider the, 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 kind of the because we, we do observe some sort of path dependency here because there, the, there are already established strategies and st- established rules of in, interaction between Russia and Kazakhstan. Sorry, yeah, uh, there was some problem, but I think it's, it's, it's gone now. So um, how to build relationship with Russia how, how to continue or discontinue specific patterns which have the, and rules and, and, and strategies of uh, cooperation and engagement on the one hand, but also how to deal with the material legacy and the status of this physical outer space infrastructure such as Bank and uh, Furthermore, there is also an element of the symbolic uh, legacy and a symbolic legacy attitude towards space uh, in general, which was uh, kind of uh, entrenched in the Soviets of in, in the later post-Soviet societies, starting from the uh, first uh, Yuri Gagarin flight, um, as, uh, in, in which was widely kind of propagated and sold to the Soviet society as an achievement of common, uh, uh, the common achievement of all Soviet people. So post-colonial approach to all this, it's a, it's a kind of a way to, as an attempt to, is, can be seen as a, an attempt to separate these attitudes towards a Soviet legacy into the contemporary uh, uh, interaction with uh, Russian uh, space and, and, and also conduct of the Russian state these days. And what probably is interesting, uh, because we do talk, we, we do hear a lot about the decolonization or decolonizing uh, the post-Soviet uh, studies. What is quite interesting uh, uh, to observe in Kazakhstan that for decades, actually, from the very beginning of and uh, and its space um, attitude towards the uh, Soviet space uh, inheritance is a, is a good example of that. The Kazakhstani strategy of becoming independent was in fact not a rejection and not a rejection of the Soviet uh, legacy, not in dismissing it as imposed colonial venture, but as a matter of fact, or rather it was a strategy of pragmatic assertion uh, of this legacy and trying to reappropriate it within its own uh, national framework and, kind of, and use it for facilitating its own development. Uh, for, as I said, this future oriented uh, Kazakhstani technonationalism. So in the remaining part of what I want to do, I will briefly talk about the kind of prehistory and how Baikonur declared the, pro- the property of Kazakhstan and what it meant for, for, for Kazakhstan for, for as a state and also for the society, what kind of reflection and uh, what kind of ideas it um, generated um, at that time. Uh, then I will discuss uh, the space program, its political goals and societal objectives, and how this uh, all this has been communicated to publics. And we'll, at the end, I will also talk about the resistance, about scripts of problematizing this space technopolitics, among others, uh, we'll discuss Baikonur as a sacrifice zone and who are these people who actually develop this uh, opposition to, to the existing technopolitics. So I will go now and just to, I'm not sure what exactly you see, yeah. Maybe this is better because there was a lot of other. So just 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 to give you some sense in space uh, that uh, uh, Baikonur is uh, occupies quite quite a large uh, territory, and the, uh, in Kazakhstan, not roughly uh, ninety to uh, by eighty five kilometers in the north. Uh, so there is a cosmodrome, uh, uh, Baikonur, and city Baikonur, 
uh, called in, uh, in a more, more Kazakhstani way, pronounced by Kanir uh, as, a, as a very center. So this is just to give you some sense of idea. So uh, quite, quite interesting that the very idea of um, state independence and, and um, in Kazakhstan had been kind of or came to be uh, intertwined with the fate of uh, 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 with the fate of Baikonur. So this is a quote from, for example, from uh, the book uh, written or was published under the name of Nazarbayev, Kazakhstan's Way, in which he uh, kind of recollected how it all came together because it was happening more or less at the same time uh, that uh, when uh, in August 1991, Baikonur Kosmodrome was declared a property of uh, Kazakhstan. And the same October, the same uh, year, the first Kazakhstani or Kazakh, also uh, ethnic uh, Kazakh cosmonaut was sent into space. This was something which was um, was really um, the, the Kazakhstani uh, leadership was working on for quite a long time, and I will talk about this uh, later. And also the declaration of Kazakhstan's independence was adopted in December. So basically when the first Kazakh, uh, uh, when the first Kazakh uh, or cosmonaut was uh, still in space, he, the, the Kazakhstan um, became independent. So somehow symbolically, the whole idea of Kazakhstan uh, um, be becoming an uh, kind of, uh, uh, owner of Baikonur, sending its own uh, cosmonaut in space, and also becoming independent nation, it's all happened within a very short period of time, and it somehow became perceived as something symbolically very much uh, inter uh, uh, connected. Uh, it's also quite ironically, actually, that the first Kazakh. Uh, um, uh, first Kazakh cosmonaut, Dr. Albakirov, who uh, was also the last cosmonaut who, who traveled to space as a Soviet citizen, because all uh, cosmonauts who traveled later were already citizens of Russian Federation or many other. Uh, so he was the last Soviet uh, citizen in space. And um, uh, obviously, now I'm I'm just showing here the list of several other cosmonauts because within uh, during the nineties and also even in two thousand fifteen there were several cosmonauts Kazakh cosmonauts who were sent on, on missions. It's quite important to mention that this, uh, their missions and whatever they worked on was prepared by Kazakhstan Research Institute, so it was very specifically designed as an enterprise uh, as a venture for Kazakhstani uh, scientists, engineers, but also Kazakhstan. Uh, uh, cosmonauts itself. Uh, their travel to space also was combined with a lot of national uh, rituals. For example, Musabayev, uh, uh, who, who was already a first cosmonaut who traveled to space as a Kazakh, as Kazakh national, as a citizen of Kazakhstan, he traveled to space uh, taking this him Kazakhstani flag, capsule containing uh, some Kazakhstani soil, Koran, for example, uh, so all this was uh, taken as a, as a kind of performance of national identity and, and working on building this connection between na Kazakhstani nationhood and space venture. But this uh, became this sending cosmonauts uh, to space for Kazakhstan uh, was kind of already not the beginning, but also quite an important achievement of some previous development. Because it's worth mentioning that after, since Baikonur was established in uh, 1955, it actually existed in Kazakhstan pretty much as an enclave and had, had very little connection with uh, Kazakhstani Republic that's hosting kind of uh, nation. Uh, obviously, due to military sensitivity uh, of space technology, it was fully co operated from Moscow. However, by the 80s already, late, especially late 80s, local authorities in Kazakhstan developed this idea that they need to, that the Kazakhstan should benefit much more from the fact that Cosmodrome exists on its land. And already, for example, in 1991 was developed a first 
and it's called, was called Comprehensive Program of Scientific, Te Technical and Economic Cooperation, Kazakhstan Cosmos. And it was adopted in March 1991, just several months before Kazakhstan was, uh, became independent. So this uh, program's objective was actually to ensure that Kazakhstan, that the Kazakhstan be benefits more from uh, various achievements of sp space technologies, uh, both in, in economic development which, and also trying to use this uh, the techno scientific potential of Baikonur uh, for republics industries and developing its new infrastructure, which will require to integrate the space services within various sectors of economy in, in Kazakhstan, including I don't know energy, techno telecommunication, mechanical engineering, uh, working on new materials, agriculture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So sending Kaza uh, Kosmonaut in 1991 was just one of these steps in order to bring or close the Soviet space program to, to kind of to Kazakhstani society. And uh, as I said, uh, Al-Bakirov became one of uh, the first such uh, cosmonaut and, uh, and this idea of um, having Three cosmonauts on the list in in the, in the in the republic in the in the country later on also allowed Kazakhstan more being more confident and claiming the place among the emerging space actors later on like the kids of in 2010s uh, when Kazakhstan actually created its uh, articulated its clearly. Um, kind of formulated vision of uh, that they want to become uh, an, a fully fledged a space power. But no, not less important was also the role played by cos uh, cosmonauts in the nation building. As I already mentioned, this will survive to all these um, uh, elements of, uh, uh, of symbols of the Kazakhstani statehood for to the space. But for example, he also took part in the International Music Festival, The Voice of Asia, where he performed the Kazakh poet Abai, uh, song, a song by Kazakh Ab uh, poet Abai and participated in the inaugural ceremony uh, for the new capital of Kazakhstan, Astana in 1998, which was also quite an, an important venture of nation building in Kazakhstan. So all these performative rituals really manifested this entanglement be between the outer space technology and ambitions to develop space technology and engage with space technology and, and the narratives of uh, national identity. And the way they did uh, manipulate, oh, sorry, I'll go to this slide first. So they really kind of echoed this, uh, what was described by scholars as a post-colonial desire to combine science, modernity, and ingenuity uh, in uh, their uh, national narratives. And here I give you some examples of chevrons for, uh, created by Kazakhstan, for Kazakhstani cosmonauts. And they clearly show the, this elements of national mythology uh, combines uh, with, uh, with space technology. With, uh, and so in this uh, way, they kind of try to not only blend tradition with modernity, but also kind of modernize the nation, but also not, not, uh, it's a kind of use it uh, for nativization of space travel, because this all, these are all, I just, I don't think I have time for this going into details, but all this is kind of very um, much, and uh, 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 has a lot of national mythology encrypted. Uh, we also know that, uh, uh, I'll just show this slide, we know that in 1994, Baikonur was actually, uh, 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 Nazarbayev and Yeltsin uh, uh, signed a lease on, uh, uh, which, a lease agreement which transferred the management responsibility and right for Baikonur to Roscosmos, the Russian uh, space uh, agency. However, before that, it's worth mentioning that there were a lot of various ideas. What can what can Kazakhstan do uh, with Baikonur? For example, already in the nineties, uh, in in spite of in general. Uh, genuine interest uh, among, among Kazakhstani officials, 
to develop their own space programs, they also uh, were very realistic and have and understood that they don't have uh, sufficient resources to to kind of to develop and to maintain uh, to de develop immediately the space program and to maintain Baikonur. So they considered a variety of scenarios what what can be done and. For example, already in uh, 1994, uh, the, in January 1994, before the Lisbon uh, agreement was signed with Russia, also the delegation from um, NASA visited Kazakhstan, and they in, expressed the interest in direct cooperation with Kazakhstan uh, and, uh, and and the idea of them having access to Baikonur without Russian interference was what was they were interested in. Well, they didn't. Uh, this plan would never be realized, uh, but the very idea of such uh, and the, such uh, the, 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 the such possibility was contemplated. Also, kind of signals that the pos there is a possibility. There's a co that there could have been alternative scenarios for using Baikonur by Kazakhstan. Uh, already much later in 2009, uh, one of the um, kind of analysts, independent analysts and experts in Kazakhstan, uh, presented this idea that Baikonur could have been uh, transformed into a global space hub with four autonomous segments uh, providing launching services for various uh, regions and countries. And Russia would be just one of them, but there would be other states, European states in East Asian states, which is quite also, once again, as I say, interesting just to understand that there were alternative scenarios uh, considered for develop for for Kazakhstan and um, in the strategies of dealing with um, Baikonur as inheritance. However, none of this was to be realized and uh, the lease was signed with Russia, which obviously also predetermined the, the, the further kind of development uh, of uh, relationship between uh, Kazakhstan and Russia. Later, in many of his, uh, in some of his publications, Nazarbayev describes his, his decision to sign this lease agreement with Russia, uh, that he, it was made in order to preserve a global inheritance, a uh, global heritage of the human space mission. So it was not very much on the, about the Soviet um, uh, legacy, but it was much more about the universal value of Baikonur as, uh, as, as, uh, as an kind of artifact of the global history of space, uh, space mission. On the other hand, he also talked a lot about the, uh, Baikonur as a child of all Soviet nations, which is not something you would hear uh, these days, but back in the 90s, when this, this is a dissolution of the Soviet Union was still very fresh uh, experience. And for many, it was pretty obvious to kind of, um, continue to think about uh, some uh, big Soviet achievements and something which was achieved and what in, in fact was uh, done by, by uh, not only Russian Russians but or Russian Federation but all Soviet nations. But also uh, very often Baikonur became criticized. Uh, this uh, sorry this list on agreement on, on Baikonur was criticized as a decision which was made under coercion um, because it also manifested, uh, it was in a way a manifestation of countries incomplete or sporadic sovereignty because there were aspects of policies in which country could not af simply afford being uh, fully independent in, make, in, in its decision making. But all, at the same time, Kazakhstan and, and Kazakhstani leadership at that time was already thinking about how uh, to harness the legacy of the Soviet space and this existence of a Baikonur in Kazakhstan as a part of their own national modernization narrative and how to make a use of it for their own uh, for, uh, to, for, for, you, uh, for the development of their own space strategy. So on the one hand, obviously, the, the lease agreement on uh, use Baikon of, of Baikonur uh, with Russia predetermined to a, a large extent uh, the degree of reliance of Kazakhstani development of its space technologies on cooperation with Russia. 
I don't have time here to go into much details, but there are multiple new agreements and new uh, kind of decisions made to implement a variety of projects. Not many of them actually came to fruition. Many of them failed at the end. But it's quite interesting uh, to see how repeatedly again and again Kazakhstani and uh, Russian officials uh, kind of were agreeing on continuation continuation of their exist uh, of their kind of uh, cooperation and in, in engagement. However, at the same time, uh, already starting in 2000, uh, 2000s, uh, the national space, Agency Cos Cosmos also uh, started its very proactive engagement with a variety of space uh, actors uh, across the globe. For example, it does the design agreement with, I just give some examples here, it's not the full list, obviously, is India, France, Israel, Germany, Japan, and UK. Uh, for example, development of satellite infrastructure by Kazakhstan um, was made after agreements on cooperation with uh, signed with, uh, uh, with uh, satellite manufacturers in France and the UK. So all these talks uh, uh, tells us a lot about this uh, clear uh, determination of Kazakhstani space officials to get away from the dependency on Russia and to position itself on this global market uh, on, and on, on the global stage of space development. When we look at this, some specific, or for example, this uh, satellite development in Kazakhstan, you can also see how um, the, the priorities of uh, decisions and uh, and um, and goals to be achieved by this you know, space project, by satellite projects, also by shifting, following kind of some sort of global dynamics. Uh, if uh, in 2002 the the first Kazakhstani satellite, Kazakhstan One program, had been um, uh, aim, uh, had aimed to uh, kind of to, op, uh, to monitor seismic uh, activities uh, on the territory of Kazakhstan starting with 2005. The program for the development was uh, kind of shifted towards more commercial, uh, uh, increasing commercial value and among others to the growing market for satellite teleco telecommunication. And at that time also Kazakhstan really had the aspiration to become a regional leader and providing the telecommunication services in the Central Asia. In 2014, this uh, focus again shifted toward remote sensing of Earth with higher resolution. In 2010 also, uh, in addition to this, they, they, the leaders in Kazakhstan decided they have to help enter the world market of satellite manufacturers. So a spacecraft assembly and testing complex was announced to be built in Astana. Once again, this cooperation with French Airbus Defense and Space. And it was inaugurated um, eight years later in Kazakhstan. So again, we, we see here clearly the, this idea of getting away from dependency and engaging with as many foreign uh, no, uh, space actors as possible. Ultimately, in uh, also what is worth mentioning that Kazakhstan uh, ad, ex, uh, uh, adopted a several Prog national programs of space development. Um, in first of them, first was uh, adopted in 1991, then in 2004, and then in 2010. And all these programs had kind of overarching objectives, um, which is creating creation of full fledged space industry. Uh, that means the needs economy and uh, needs of the economy and society, expanding Kazakhstani niche in the world market of space services, also indigenization of space, uh, because uh, there is a con this constant emphasis on local production and local expertise, which was uh, kind of really important. And also, once again, consolidating a sovereignty, which means breaking or going, uh, getting away from dependency on uh, cooperation with Russia and developing what uh, can be called a new space internationalism, which means that internationalism on a global scale. And here you can only see the, this headquarter of the national space company, Garish Safari in Astana. What is also interesting uh, that Kazakhstan uh, 
so, so the space as uh, well uh, kind of space of officials are quite aware of the fact that the behind the facade of this official rhetoric uh, about the prestige of space development and how nation benefits uh, from being a present and engaged in, in, the, in the development of space uh, programs. Uh, there is always a question of practical use of these technologies and how economy and especially society um, can benefit and to what extent they are aware of these benefits. So as um, we, we can see how specific strategies of domestication of space and uh, technologies can, uh, have been uh, used in, in the country. Uh, so among others, uh, what has been kind of widely publicized in media is, uh, uh, is the fact that how observing critically important structure dams, for example, and responding to emergencies uh, is uh, how, how space in, is important uh, for doing this, how space is involved and in using uh, in remote as observation and, and helps to fight corruption in land use, which is a quite an and an important question in the society, for example, also tackling the issue of illegal landfills or even de uh, developing uh, precision farming, and which helps also to transform the image of agriculture as something extremely modern and technologically advanced. Uh, so all these uh, ways of domesticate technology and to present and to, to widely publicize the way how space technology help uh, and what, what they actually do to society is really important a way to, to kind of to keep uh, society um, happy with, with those, all those uh, huge spending which obviously developing of space uh, technology uh, requires. Uh, so um, now I uh, and, and just want to make sure we have some uh, time left for questions. So just few things I want to mention here at the end, uh, that not everyone in Kazakhstan is quite happy with existence of Baikonur, with operation of Baikonur. And uh, they also, they, they do consider actually Baikonur as, as a problematic uh, spot in the Kazakhstani uh, national development, not only because uh, it's a space, but also especially because it's been used, continuously used by a Russian uh, a space agency. So this whole idea of Baikonur as a sacrifice zone uh, highlights all these points of contention um, and which, as a matter of fact, can also uh, have always has often been stretched and become a way to problematize in general, the political regime, the system of power existing in the country. Here I mentioned just a couple of uh, actors who can be uh, found in, um, in Kazakhstan who try, who criticize or, or deal with this, uh, or, or express this resistance uh, uh, to space technology. Uh, this is a Karaganda Ecological Museum, which is actually represents quite soft version of this criticism. But there are other uh, groups such as anti heptic for example, which was active in between 20, uh, 2012 and 15, was much more, uh, 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 I would say, aggressive uh, in a way in its uh, um, expression, in expressing its um, disagreement with, with the fact that Baikonur continues to be used by Russia uh, because it can has been perceived as an kind of imperial and as a continuous continuing uh, colonization of uh, the Kazakhstani uh, land and there are a couple of others such as Baikonur for civil rights and also Baikonur eco monitoring this um, and the two organizations which uh, deal with uh, both the, the environmental uh, idea of environment, sorry, environmental justice, but all, also on the other hand, they all combine it kind of this discourse, also with a discourse of national sovereignty and how uh, without um, kind of 
retaking uh, of ownership uh, and solving the problem of Baikonur uh, in Kazakhstan, the sovereignty of uh, Kazakhstan is never be, will never be com complete. So they do actually as, uh, have this uh, political ambitions um, which go beyond uh, their opposition to state policy. Uh, but uh, for example, you, you see one of the photographs showing Sivodnya, uh, today anti till tomorrow Maidan, which is clearly a, a reference to Ukrainian uh, revolution, which also uh, kind of builds this connection between the, the resistance to presence of Russian uh, space agency and uh, the impact in broader terms of uh, Russian Federation on, on Kazakhstani life and on Kazakhstani politics. Uh, here, I wanted to show, but I don't think if I have time for a small video, probably I will just skip it for now. In general, this, uh, res uh, this, all these actors who involve in to, uh, to resistance to space and also to, to cri to crit in critiquing the Baikonur existence, uh, there are a couple of the, what, what we can uh, kind of how we can structure the argument. It's, it is about the protection of the environment. It, they talk a lot about the health issues of local residents affected by space launches. And uh, they also talk about Baikonur as an excuse for Russian Federation to remain on Kazakh land and uh, as a fair for being uh, um, uh, Baikonur being a, a symbol of this enduring colonization. And they also criticize Kazakhstani government authorities acting on the in the interest of Russia because they don't see Kazakhstani officials or Kazakhstani government protecting enough their society, their people, especially on the ground from uh, potential or real abuses, both of, of human rights, but also some uh, environmental thing. Issues and here I wanted to just show at the very end these two images because uh, also the, the, there is a very broad kind of reflection on space and cosmic uh, engagement um, of Kazakh people since uh, the beginning of uh, say, since the moment when Baikonur was uh, built in Kazakhstan and um, and there is in you uh, here we find the whole range of uh, attitudes towards uh, space, starting from rather positive uh, reflection and also kind of um, reiterating this enthusiasm of, for space and this romanticizing image of space is and taking us uh, a society to a new stage. And this is Ashad Ahmed Diarov's work rocket up a stage is, uh, is actually the work in itself uses a space imagery to talk about the, the the emancipation of Kazakh women in fact in one of his interviews he reflected on this work but there is you can also find this bitter skepticism and criticism of um, Kazakhstani ambitions and pretends to be uh, a space power while in fact the country has too many other problems existing in society, which um, could have been solved rather, solved rather than spending um, uh, resources on building this uh, ambitious space program. And I guess I'll stop here because probably I will rather save some time for questions if we have some. Yeah. So thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nelly. That was amazing and such an informative presentation. Now we would like to open the floor for questions. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask the questions. And if you want, if you don't feel like speaking, you can type that in the chat box and I can um, speak it out loud. I have a question about one of the last things you mentioned uh, when you mentioned um, uh, human rights and environmental abuses. Um, I think I'm kind of familiar with the environmental ones, but I was not aware of the human rights. Could you expand on that a little bit? I just want to check. I've, do we un just uh, I should answer now or we collect questions? Should I? Uh, no. I guess yeah, you can answer now. 
Okay, yeah, so human right, right, um, rights abuses, it's uh, these particular two organizations I mentioned, they are dealing with the rights of Kazakh nationals who live in city Baikonur and walk on Kastodrom and walk in, and live and reside in, in this territory because it's actually the question relates to the much bigger issue of the status um, of Baikonur, uh, of Cosmodrome, but also city. And uh, the matter of fact, the transfer of rights on use of uh, Cosmodrome came together on with the rights on use of city with nationals, which is highly problematic, obviously. And over the decades uh, since 1994, we are now almost uh, approaching three decades and then, Kazakhstani officials tried to kind of to, to rewrite the rules because initially Baikonur, or, or city Baikonur, even though it was given this Kazakh name instead of Leninsk until 1995, however, it did or live on within this ju judiciary of Russian uh, Federation. And the human rights abuses uh, they talk about, this is about the persecution, it's about discrimination of Kazakhstani officials in Baikonur, among others, just like to give you an example. Yeah. Um, I hope that answers the question. Uh, are there any more questions on the floor? Uh, okay. May I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I was just really interested about um, this this kind of romanticization you had uh, of kind of Kazakhs um, Kazakhstan's place in let's say like the cosmonaut space race and you had mentioned previously how Kazakhstan wants to create its own little niche I thought that was really interesting I was wondering how you could extrapolate perhaps um, how this national element with the the idea of you know space nationalism and, and carving out a place for Kazakhstan's um, yeah, how you said it, you know, Kazakhstan's niche in this kind of globalization of, of space exploration and how that um, ties into this nationalist idea of, of, of owning the Kazakh narrative. It was just very interesting how you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. Yeah, well, the whole idea, and I think that when we talk about nationalism, it is important to remember that when we talk about nationalism in post-colonial and this, what I call semi-peripheral settings. So internationalization, like becoming part of international community is, is an asset, it's an extra instrument of nation building. So it's not just condition, it's not the fact of engagement, but this is something which reflects back on the position in uh, on the, on the kind of on the status of national um, uh, ideology, and the way how they link together. Um, for example, while building all these connections in production of or launching satellites, for example, by Kazakhstan. Obviously, there are many challenges because, especially uh, as we live in the era when not so much states as private commercial uh, actors are becoming much more important. And it is rather difficult to compete for a state like Kazakhstan, even if it's resourceful, kind of rich in resources, with commercial um, uh, players, uh, which have uh, still much bigger resources than, uh, than any single country had. So what they do is they, they kind of try to build, uh, to engage with a variety of this kind of, there's a list of nations. And I was quite surprised to see that at some point, Kazakhstani officials, for example, traveled to Africa and to find those partners where Kazakhstan could position itself as already more developed and more advanced and already having something as uh, uh, in comparison with those who have uh, less than Kazakhstan has in terms of space development. So I thought this, uh, uh, I find this kind of working quite interestingly together that it's not just about branding uh, Kazakhstan as, as, a, as a advanced technologically nation, but also finding um, and in, uh, and in getting into this engagement in various entanglements with variety of 
actors across the globe where they could be position themselves as well actor uh, as partners and potentially not just uh, like lesser partner dependent but also partner which could give something to other well they, they try they were trying to sell some images from remote sensing um, received from uh, by Kazakhstani satellites um, in African nations. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I think these two aspects of na national identity, but also um, trying to position this identity on the global space uh, uh, and on the global arena, they work quite. Um, well together when it comes to technological advancement. And this is why they can also um, recycle kind of the so, so, uh, Soviet, uh, engage, the history of the Soviet engagement for the production of this new Im image of Kazakhstan as already independent nation with this underpinning of previous history of development. Not unlike many other space uh, countries who want to become space players, but have uh, they have absolutely nothing. Uh, so they just need to start from scratch. Thank you very much. That was uh, quite informative. Thank you. And I, if I may just ask a, just a quick follow-up. It's interesting, um, this element of, of even contemporary um, discord with the presence of Russia um, in, in the idea, like you said, that, you know, um, global positioning with these global partners is, is an asset. It's something um, that is necessary in order to be part of this global network. Uh, so very interesting. Thank you again. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, you can go ahead. Olga, do you have a question? Ah, OK, hi. My name is Olga, and I live in New York already for almost 30 years. But I obviously moved from the Soviet Union, and my relatives lived all over Soviet Union, and my father is from Kazakhstan. So I kind of know a little bit about the situation there. And my friends just several years ago moved from there and um, to actually Russia citing that um, corruption in Kazakhstan is much even worse than in Russia. And it's actually, I'm not familiar what's going on there, but actually in all post-Soviet republics, it's even worse than in Russia. So they moved, one moved to Siberia, other one moved somewhere in European uh, territory. So that, that probably, I'm not saying that you should address it now, that, but it's probably also should be like taken, uh, you should uh, know like maybe, not mention maybe it, but it's, it's really um, also um, big, big issue. And especially how they use these these cosmodrome, and is it possible? It's it's actually maybe even questions like uh, it's not uh, the, the, these these um, um, should be done. Uh, the, 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 is there possibility for corruption? <laughs> you see, <laughs> and how it's 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 working, but. Um, I'm not sure that you, if you would like, you can add this, of course, it, but I wanted to say I'm working here on a um, uh, big project, art science project, which calls Archetime Project. And, and, and part of this project is mythology of the future. And I would like to contact you separately from this. Is it possible somehow to get your information? Oh yeah, absolutely. You you just uh, um, well the easiest way just Google my name and you will end up at the university website, or I can um, write you my email or address is just and dot bikis exit ac dot uk. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. If yeah, possible, and, you can also. Sorry. Yeah, about, about the correction corruption. Oh, well, that's is there. <laughs> Yeah, that's I, I agree that all post-Soviet countries struggle and uh, with that, and it does create a lot of problems. There's, there's no doubt about that as well. What I can say that uh, what I think is what 
gives us probably, I'm, I'm not sure about the comparison, whether it's worse or, or better or worse who, than Russia, but I also know that they do try to implement various um, mechanisms to find corruption. For example, if you go on the website of Karish Sapari, uh, Garish Sapari, this national uh, a company, in, um, he was a leading actor, there is a special on the first page, uh, there is a special line, like if you, you face corruption, just it's kind of an open line. They do try to do that, something about this, but obviously, I mean, yeah, this is not something that I addressed in my but, um, my research because, yeah, I was dealing mostly with, with discourses, with documents, uh, also interview with interviews uh, with officials, and I also probably need to mention here that uh, this part of my research was uh, um, supported by a grant of the Kazakhstani. Um, uh, for, uh, National Foundation and yeah, and there is a whole group of people who helps uh, with uh, interviews uh, on the on the ground, especially now when uh, and also with COVID uh, when I couldn't really travel. But so yes, the the corruption is there. Um, but they also try, at least in Kazakhstan, I do know uh, about the attempts to, to kind of to address it. It's probably worth mentioning that also um, on, in Kazakhstan, they, they also for years already, for decades, have the strategy of educating their not only scholars, not the like scientists, engineers, but also public administrators, uh, people involved in um, in kind of managing the country, uh, they travel around the globe, they get educated in various universities. Well, so I guess I, there is a hope that new generation of Kazakh people will understand uh, that corruption is as, as a bad thing to have and will try to get away from it. So I, I don't quite know what, what else to say. Yeah. yeah, but I know the problem exists, yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Um, and please do contact me. Yeah. Yeah, you can drop in your email ID in the chat if you'd yeah. like that. Yes. And there's another question in the chat box. Uh, they want to have. They want to ask about the indigenous uh, indigenization of space science. Uh, they said that they're curious if these groups connect, relate themselves to other indigenous movements happening globally, and if so, if you have any example. Well, what I meant by this indigenization is about, uh, I'm not aware of any connections globally, I have to say, but I, I rather see it as a, as, a, as, a, as a tendency or as a strategy to make sure that all space project, for example, envisioned by officials or financed by, by Kazakhstani state, they are not being implemented by hands and by, uh, by employing a simply foreign scientists. So they, what they do, they actually put an effort in educating and bring kind of uh, this, making this extra work, but educating, educating local people local engineers and uh, this is what i thought that, that actually the whole vision of kazakhstan as becoming an, an, an important player in space in developing space technologies it actually uh, reflects back on the interest in educational uh, uh, in various in, uh, educational pro, uh, in, uh, new institutions for example even schools special schools have been established just next to the national the former national space agency there is an interesting um uh, very um, kind of, um famous uh, I think it's private school actually with a very uh, good level of education, but overall it reflects on the way how how simply a STEM subject become popularized and the whole idea is just not to have a science space project developed by or alien or by foreign hands, but by being made by by local people. This is more or less what I meant. So yeah. Yeah, and then I hope I, I answered somehow. Um, are there any more questions on the floor? If not, I think that marks the end of today's event. Yeah. Okay, yeah, um, thanks again for inviting.
me. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Nelly. It was a pleasure having you here, and thank you for all the information that you gave us. Um, thank you, guys. I'll see you in the next event. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you again. So I just want to